Welcome back to a special episode of Greenwood Gab. Today we're doing banned books readings. I am Sarah Reynolds. And I am Natalie Browning. And we're just going to jump right in. We've got a number of library staff members who have joined us today to read from some of their favorite banned and or challenged books. Yeah, and we're excited to have some new voices of some library staff on the podcast that you haven't heard before. And we're excited for you to listen to these banned books excerpts. Hi, this is Brent Roberts. I'm the Dean of Greenwood Library, and I'm excited once again to be on the Greenwood Gab podcast. Thank you so much for inviting me. One fun fact about me is that my minor, when I was working on my PhD program, was in Native American Studies. And that ties directly. What a great segue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. That was amazing. The perfect segue into the book that I'm going to be reading from for Banned Books Week. It's called An Indigenous People's History of the United States by Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. And full disclosure, I actually read the Young People version, the Indigenous People's History of the United States for Young People because I thought this might be the one that is more likely to be removed as time goes on. It has been banned or challenged in at least a couple of situations that we're aware of, primarily because, as you will see, it provides a different narrative than the one that we're accustomed to of the founding of our nation. And I think that's all I'll say about it. You'll be able to see very easily, once I read from the book, how it flies in the face of some of our established narratives. So, first section. When Europeans arrived on this continent, they often seemed unaware that many conditions that were useful to them were the result of indigenous people's stewardship of the land. Some early settlers remarked that in many places they could easily have driven carriages between the trees. Others commented about large clearings in the forests, some with well-tended gardens and cornfields. They did not seem to recognize that for thousands of years, native people had been making roads and clearing spaces to make trading, hunting, and agriculture easier. Willfully or not, they depicted the land as empty, devoid of civilized people, and theirs for the taking. North America in 1492 was not a virgin wilderness. It was a network of indigenous nations, a network of peoples of the corn, the link between peoples of the north and the south can be seen in the diffusion of corn from Mesoamerica along routes created by the people and used for millennia. It was also challenged because it tends to undermine our vision of everyone involved in the founding of our nation as heroes. We've often heard of the United States being called a nation of immigrants. This is what the book has to say about that. The nation of immigrants framework obscures the U.S. practice of settler colonialism. This book takes the view that settler colonialism was key to building the United States. The goal of settler colonialism is to take over all resources in a region, particularly the land. During the colonial era, for example, European business corporations received military support to take over and use land and other resources for profit in foreign areas around the world, including what came to be known as the Americas. As more and more settlers arrived, one settlement paved the way for another and another. This gave the European governments and the government-backed corporations control and influence farther and farther from the original settlements. The U.S. followed a similar growth model after independence. The following ideas are basic to American settler colonialism. Number one, white supremacy. The idea that European American civilization is superior to those of the American Indians and of the Africans who were enslaved for economic gain is called white supremacy. At the individual level, this means that white lives are seen as more valuable than those of darker skinned people. Number two, African American slavery. Although slavery is mostly associated with the American South, the entire country as it grew benefited from the enslavement of people, primarily Africans and African Americans. And number three, a policy of genocide and land theft. The United Nations now defines genocide as an act or acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part 
a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. So you can see how that potentially could make some people upset. It's a, it's a different story than what we're accustomed to, and it brings to light some of the assumptions that we have about the history of our country. And just one other, can I, can I share just one other? Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. This one kind of ties in with how we talk about American history. We've heard about westward expansion, manifest destiny, and there's a famous historian named Frederick Jackson Turner that as a history major, I heard about a lot. He was famous because in 1893, he got up and declared that the American frontier was now closed. America had at that point been settled. This book addresses that. The so-called Turner thesis, which he first presented in 1893, became the most influential perspective on the history of the U.S. West in the 20th century. Turner's ideas support the popular belief in American exceptionalism, and they continue to affect how U.S. history is taught. However, several 21st century historians see Turner's ideas as based on biases about indigenous peoples. He believed, wrongly, that indigenous North American cultures had no real influence on the settlers except as roadblocks to progress. He viewed native cultures as backward and primitive in comparison with the settlers' culture, which he saw as dynamic and sophisticated. He also held the mistaken idea that the homelands of the native people were a wilderness that had to be tamed and properly developed by settlers so that America's democracy could proceed. I'm Sandra Haney, a library information associate here at Greenwood, and I've been on the podcast before. Today I'm reading Lawn Boy by Jonathan Evison. I picked this one because I was doing the display for Banned Books Week, and I saw the list of the top 10 books from the past year, and I decided I would read something off that. This was published in 2018. It had some notoriety last fall but I'm not reading one of those passages. <laughs> in this scene, uh, the main character is Mike Munoz. He's 22. This is an adult novel. And in this scene, he has just quit his job. Dazed and numb with apprehension, I had neither the inclination nor the courage to go home with the bad news. So I took comfort where I usually took comfort, the library. As kids, Nate and I spent untold hours in the library while my mom was at work. We ate bruised apples and crumbling saltines, napping on the quilted sofas. The library was the most stable thing in our lives, the only thing in the whole damn society that said to little Mike Munoz, here you go, kid, it's all yours for the asking. No matter that your ears were dirty and your hair was greasy, no matter that your mentally challenged big brother didn't have much of an indoor voice, or that he tended to throw books and pee on the bathroom floor and scare the clownfish shitless, at the library, a little ferret of a kid like me had a chance. The only currency he needed was a library card. For two hours, I scanned the fiction section for distraction. What I wanted was a book written by a guy who worked as a landscaper or a cannery grunt or a guy who installed heating vents. Something about modern class struggle in the trenches. Something plain spoken without all the shiver thin coverlets of snow and all the rest of that luminous prose. Something that didn't have a pretentious quote at the beginning from some old geezer poet that gave away the whole point of the book. Something that didn't employ the fishbowl lens or a prismatic narrative structure or any of that crap they teach rich kids out in the cornfields. I wanted a book that grabbed me by the collar and implored me to conquer my fears and embrace the unknown. I wanted a novel that acted as a clarion call for the disenfranchised of the world. Not 250 pages of navel-gazing about the nuances of saddle-making topped off with some hokey epiphany. I wanted realism, grit. I wanted my transcendence with grease under the fingernails and unpaid bills piling up on the countertop. Where were the books about me? Maybe I should write the goddamn great American landscaping novel. Why shouldn't I have a voice? Just because I never went to college, because I haven't traveled the world or lived in New York City or fought in Iraq or done anything else of distinction? I suppose you could make a strong argument for any one of those, but I believe the world could use the great American landscaping novel. After all, most of us are mowing someone else's lawn one way or another, and most of us can't afford to travel the world or live in New York City. Most of us feel like the world is giving us a big fat middle finger when it's not kicking us in the face with a steel-toed boot. And most of us feel powerless, motivated but powerless, entertained but powerless, informed but powerless, fleetingly content, most of the time broke, sometimes hopeful but ultimately powerless, and angry, don't forget angry. 
The problem I soon came to realize was that landscapers, especially unemployed ones, and cannery grunts and heating duct installers didn't have time to while away their days writing novels. They had bills to pay, cars to fix, disabled siblings to care for. I finally picked up a handful of titles off the new arrivals rack, though none of them really appealed to me. MFA fiction, said a voice. I looked up to discover the same librarian who had recommended the octopus to me. He was pushing one of those tan wheelie carts loaded with recently returned books. Not your usual librarian, this guy. Nothing like those formidable librarians of my youth with their translucent nylon stockings. He was wearing a puke colored sweater and a t-shirt that said, be the change you want. I mean, the writing's good, lyrical and all that, he said, if it's sentences you want. But so much of it feels like affectation and craft to me. Got any wrecks? What are you looking for? Something angry, I said, like the last one you gave me, the octopus. It made me want to put a brick through a window. Ah, follow me then, he said. He led me back to the fiction section and began running his fingers gingerly over the book spines. He picked out something called The Jungle by a guy named Sinclair. Is this guy dead? Yes, you might have read it in high school, he said. Not if it was assigned. Then you should definitely check it out. Classic muckraking. Cool, thanks, man. I'm Andrew, he said, extending a hand. Mike, I said. You should go ahead and check out the new fiction, too, he said. By all means, don't take my word for it. See what you think. Maybe you'll like the acoustics. Once again, the library had my back. I left feeling a lot less desperate and scared than when I'd arrived. I clung to that security as I walked down the hill to town, clutching my five books. My name is Sherry Scheidler, and I'm the acquisition specialist at Greenwood Library. The title that I have selected is I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, and it's by Maya Angelou. I picked this because she passed away recently, and I think she's an incredible writer, and I think it would it's just an important thing to do something by her. So my excerpt. Mrs. Bertha Flowers was the aristocrat of black stamps. She had the grace of control to appear warm in the coldest weather, and on the Arkansas summer days, it seemed she had a private breeze which swirled around, cooling her. She was thin without the taut look of wiry people, and her printed voile dresses and flowered hats were as right for her as denim overalls for a farmer. She was our side's answer to the richest white woman in town. Her skin was a rich black that would have peeled like a plum if snagged, but then no one would have thought of getting close enough to Mrs. Flowers to ruffle her dress, let alone snag her skin. She didn't encourage familiarity. She wore gloves, too. I don't think I ever saw Miss Flowers laugh, but she smiled often, a slow widening of her thin black lips to show even, small, white teeth, then the slow, effortless closing. When she chose to smile on me, I always wanted to thank her. The action was so graceful and inclusively benign. She was one of the few gentlewomen I have ever known and has remained throughout my life the measure of what a human being can be. One summer afternoon, sweet milk fresh in my memory, she stopped at the store to buy provisions. Another Negro woman of her health and age would have been expected to carry the paper sacks home in one hand. But Mama said, Sister Flowers, I'll send Bailey up to your house with these things. She smiled that slow, dragging smile. Thank you, Miss Henderson. I'd prefer Marguerite, though. My name was beautiful when she said it. I've been meaning to talk to her anyway. They gave each other age group looks. There was a little path beside the rocky road, and Miss Flowers walked in front, swinging her arms and picking her way over the stones. She said, without turning her head to me, I hear you're doing very good schoolwork, Marguerite, but that it's all written. The teachers report that they have trouble getting you to talk in class. We passed the triangular farm on our left and the path widened to allow us to walk together. I hung back in the separate, unasked and unanswerable questions. Come and walk along with me, Marguerite. I couldn't have refused even if I wanted to. She pronounced my name so nicely. Or more correctly, she spoke each word with such clarity that I was certain a foreigner who didn't understand English could have understood her. 
Now, no one is going to make you talk. Possibly no one can. But bear in mind, language is man's way of communicating with his fellow man, and it is language alone which separates him from the lower animals. That was a totally new idea to me, and I would need time to think about it. Your grandmother says you read a lot, every chance you get. That's good, but not good enough. Words mean more than what is set down on paper. It takes the human voice to infuse them with the shades of deeper meaning. I memorized the part about the human voice infusing words. It seems so valid and poetic. She said she was going to give me some books and that I not only must read them, I must read them aloud. She suggested that I try to make a sentence sound in as many different ways as possible. I'll accept no excuse if you return a book to me that has been badly handled. My imagination boggled at the punishment I would deserve if, in fact, I did abuse a book of Miss Flowers. Death would be too kind and brief. The odors in the house surprised me. Somehow I had never connected Miss Flowers with food or eating or any other common experience of common people. There must have been an outhouse too, but my mind never recorded it. The sweet scent of vanilla had met us as she opened the door. I made tea cookies this morning. You see, I had planned to invite you for cookies and lemonade so we could have this little chat. The lemonade is in the ice box. It followed that Ms. Flowers would have ice on an ordinary day when most families in our town bought ice late on Saturdays only a few times during the summer to be used in the wooden ice cream freezers. She took the bags from me and disappeared through the kitchen door. I looked around the room that I had never in my wildest fantasies imagined I would see. Brown photographs leered or threatened from the walls and the white, freshly done curtains pushed against themselves and against the wind. I wanted to gobble up the room entire and take it to Bailey, who would help me analyze and enjoy it. Samantha Dunn Miller. My main role here at the library is supervising the student assistants. A fun fact is that I have four children ranging in age from 38 to 21. The title of my book is Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. I picked it because I can remember it from childhood up on through the years as just being a book that made me happy. All winter, Wilbur watched over Charlotte's egg sack as though he were guarding his own children. He had scooped out a special place in the manure for the sack next to the board fence. On very cold nights, he lay so that his breath would warm it. For Wilbur, nothing in life was so important as this small round object. Nothing else mattered. Patiently, he awaited the end of the winter and the coming of the little spiders. Life is always a rich and steady time when you're waiting for something to happen or to hatch. The winter ended at last. One fine sunny morning after breakfast, Wilbur stood watching his precious sack. He wasn't thinking of anything much. As he stood there, he noticed something moving. He stepped closer and stared. A tiny spider crawled from the sack. It was no bigger than a grain of sand, no bigger than the head of a pen. Its body was gray with a black stripe underneath. Its legs were gray and tan. It looked just like Charlotte. Wilbur trembled all over when he saw it. The little spider waved at him. Then Wilbur looked more closely. Two more little spiders crawled out and waved. They climbed round and round on the sack exploring their new world. Then three more little spiders, then eight, then ten. Charlotte's children were here at last. Hello there, he said. The first spider said hello, but its voice was so small, Wilbur couldn't hear it. I am an old friend of your mother's, said Wilbur. I'm glad to see you. Are you all right? Is everything all right? The little spiders waved their forelegs at him. Wilbur could see by the way they acted that they were glad to see him. Is there anything I can get you? Is there anything you need? The young spiders just waved. One spider climbed to the top of the fence. Then it did something that came of a great surprise to Wilbur. The spider stood on its head, pointed its spinnerets in the air, and let loose a cloud of fine silk. The silk formed a balloon. As Wilbur watched, the spider let go of the fence and rose into the air. 
Goodbye, it said as it sailed through the doorway. Wait a minute, Wilbur screamed. Where do you think you're going? But the spider was already out of sight. Then another baby spider crawled to the top of the fence, stood on its head, made a balloon, and sailed away. Then another spider, then another. The air was soon filled with the tiny balloons, each balloon carrying a spider. Wilbur was frantic. Charlotte's babies were disappearing at a great rate. Come back, children, he cried. Goodbye, they called. Goodbye, goodbye. At last, one spider took time enough to stop and talk to Wilbur before making its balloon. We're leaving here on the warm updraft. This is our moment for setting forth. We're aeronauts, and we are going out into the world to make webs for ourselves. But where, asked Wilbur, wherever the wind takes us, high, low, near, far, east, west, north, south, we take to the breeze, we go as we please. Are all of you going, asked Wilbur. You can't all go. I would be left alone with no friends. Your mother wouldn't want that to happen, I'm sure. The air was now so full of balloonists that the barn cellar looked almost as though a mist had gathered. Balloons by the dozen were rising, circling, and drifting away through the door, sailing off on the gentle winds. Cries of goodbye, goodbye, goodbye came weakly to Wilbur's ears. He couldn't bear to watch any more. In sorrow, he sank to the ground and closed his eyes. This seemed like the end of the world to be deserted by Charlotte's children. Wilbur cried himself to sleep. When he woke, it was late afternoon. He was standing there, thinking of her, when he heard a small voice. Salutations, it said. I'm up here. So am I, said another tiny voice. So am I, said a third voice. Three of us are staying. We like this place, and we like you. What are your names, please, asked Wilbur, trembling with joy. I'll tell you my name, replied the first little spider, if you tell me why you are trembling. I'm trembling with joy, said Wilbur. Then my name is Joy, said the first spider. What was my mother's middle initial, asked the second spider. A, said Wilbur. Then my name is Arania, said the spider. How about me, asked the third spider. Will you just pick out a nice sensible name for me? Something not too long not too fancy, and not too dumb. Wilbur thought hard. Nellie, he suggested. Fine. I like that very much, said the third spider. You may call me Nellie. It was a happy day for Wilbur, and many more happy, tranquil days followed. I'm Jamie Crow. I'm the archives and records specialist. I am running out of fun facts, so maybe that will be my fun fact. <laughs> The book I'm reading is The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. And I picked it because whenever we talk about banned books, it's always the first one that comes to mind because it was something I read in high school and we talked about it being banned. And when I read it, I was like, why? Like, what is in this book that's so like, like offensive to people? And I think part of it is that it's written in the 1950s and it's a young adult kind of challenging authority and that's why it's essentially challenged on there's some other reasons too, but that's just kind of always stuck with me. So it's definitely the one I think of kind of the most when we talk about banned books. And then this little selection is just near the end of the book and Holden is talking to one of his former teachers. So, and I just kind of like, I like this little bit, so I'm going to read it. <laughs> All right. You could tell he wasn't tired at all, though. He was pretty oiled up for one thing. I think that one of these days, he said, you're going to have to find out where you want to go, and then you've got to start going there. But immediately, you can't afford to lose a minute, not you. I nodded because he was looking right at me and all, but I wasn't too sure what he was talking about. I was pretty sure I knew, but I wasn't too positive at the time. I was too damn tired. And I hate to tell you, he said, but I think that once you have a fair idea where you want to go, your first move will be to apply yourself in school. You'll have to. You're a student. Whether the idea appeals to you or not, you're in love with knowledge. And I think you'll find once you get past all the Mr. Venises and their oral comp, Mr. Vincens, I said. He meant all the Mr. Vincens, not all the Mr. Venises. I shouldn't have interrupted him, though. All right, the Mr. Vincens. Once you get past all the Mr. Vincens, you're going to start getting closer and closer. That is, if you want to, and if you look for it and wait for it, to the kind of information that will be very, 
very dear to your heart. Among other things, you'll find that you're not the first person who was ever confused and frightened and even sickened by human behavior. You're by no means alone on that score. You'll be excited and stimulated to know. Many, many men have been just as troubled morally and spiritually as you are right now. Happily, some of them kept records of their troubles. You'll learn from them if you want to. Just as someday, if you have something to offer, someone will learn something from you. It's a beautiful reciprocal arrangement, and it isn't education, it's history, it's poetry. He stopped and took a big drink out of his highball. Then he started again. Boy, he was really hot. I was glad I didn't try to stop him or anything. I'm not trying to tell you, he said, that only educated and scholarly men are able to contribute something valuable to the world. It's not so. But I do say that educated and scholarly scholarly men, if they're brilliant and creative to begin with, unfortunately, it's rarely the case, tend to leave infinitely more valuable records behind them than men do who are merely brilliant and creative. They tend to express themselves more clearly, and they usually have a passion for following their thoughts through to the end. And most important, nine times out of ten, they have some humility than the unscholarly thinker. Do you follow me at all? Yes, sir. He didn't say anything again for quite a while. I don't know if you've ever done it, but it's sort of hard to sit around waiting for somebody to say something when they're thinking and all. It really is. I kept trying not to yawn. It wasn't that I was bored or anything. I wasn't, but I was so damn sleepy all of a sudden. My name is Christy Jerome. I am a library information specialist here at Greenwood Library. A fun fact about me is that I am an LED saber combat martial artist, so I regularly do tournaments and fight with the proverbial lightsaber. The book I'm going to read is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. I picked this book because it happens to have a lot of aspects of it that we can see reflected in our current world, even though this book was written in the 1930s. I think it's a book that everybody needs to read, no matter how creepy it is. A New Theory of Biology was the title of the paper which Mustafa Mond had just finished reading. He sat for some time, meditatively frowning, then picked up his pen and wrote across the title page, The author's mathematical treatment of the conception of purpose is novel and highly ingenious, but heretical and, so far as the present social order is concerned, dangerous and potentially subversive, not to be published. He underlined the words. The author will be kept under supervision. His transference to the Marine Biological Station of St. Helena may become necessary. A pity, he thought, as he signed his name. It was a masterly piece of work. But once you began admitting explanations in terms of purpose, well, you didn't know what the result might be. It was the sort of idea that might easily decondition the more unsettled minds among the higher caste, make them lose their faith in happiness as the sovereign good and take to believing, instead, that the goal was somewhere beyond, somewhere outside the present human sphere. That the purpose of life was not the maintenance of well-being, but some intensification and refining of consciousness, some enlargement of knowledge. Which was, the controller reflected, quite possibly true but not, in the present circumstance, admissible. He picked up his pen again, and under the words, not to be published, drew a second line, thicker and blacker than the first, then sighed. What fun it would be, he thought, if one didn't have to think about happiness. Thank you very much to, let's see if I can remember everyone, Sandra, Sherry, Brent, Jamie, Samantha, Christy, those are probably out of order, but I think I got everyone. (laughs) Good job. (laughs) Now, Natalie and I are going to share our banned books readings. Would you like to go first? Sure. Yeah, you know, we couldn't do this without us participating. I chose The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebold. And really, I just chose it because the first time I read this, it had an impact on me, like the way that it begins is kind of just throws you right into the story. And it's got kind of a mystery and fantasy aspect to it. So if you've listened to other podcast episodes, you know, that's my my cup of tea. So I'm just going to read you right from the very beginning in the first chapter. My name was Salmon, like the fish. First name Susie. 
I was 14 when I was murdered on December 6, 1973. In newspaper photos of missing girls from the 70s, most look like me. White girls with mousy brown hair. This was before kids of all races and genders started appearing on milk cartons or in the Daily Mail. It was still back when people believed things like that didn't happen. In my junior high yearbook, I had a quote from a Spanish poet my sister had turned me on to, Juan Ramon Jimenez. It went like this. If they give you ruled paper, write the other way. I chose it both because it expressed my contempt for my structured surroundings, a la the classroom, and because not being some dopey quote from a rock group, I thought it marked me as literary. I was a member of the chess club and chem club and burned everything I tried to make in Mrs. Delmenico's home ec class. My favorite teacher was Mr. Bott, who taught biology and liked to animate the frogs and crawfish we had to dissect by making them dance in their waxed pans. I wasn't killed by Mr. Bot, by the way. Don't think every person you're going to meet in here is a suspect. That's the problem. You never know. Mr. Bot came to my memorial, as, may I add, did almost the entire junior high school. I was never so popular and cried quite a lot. He had a sick kid. We all knew this. So when he laughed at his own jokes, which were rusty way before I had him, we laughed too, forcing it sometimes just to make him happy. His daughter died a year and a half after I did. She had leukemia, but I never saw her in my heaven. My murderer was a man from our neighborhood. My mother liked his border flowers, and my father talked to him once about fertilizer. My murderer believed in old-fashioned things like eggshells and coffee grounds, which he said his own mother had used. My father came home smiling, making jokes about how the man's garden might be beautiful, but it would stink to high heaven once a heat wave hit. But on December 6, 1973, it was snowing, and I took a shortcut through the cornfield back from the junior high. It was dark out because the days were shorter in winter, and I remember how the broken corn stalks made my walk more difficult. The snow was falling lightly, like a flurry of small hands, and I was breathing through my nose until it was running so much that I had to open my mouth. Six feet from where Mr. Harvey stood, I stuck my tongue out to taste a snowflake. Don't let me startle you, Mr. Harvey said. Of course, in a cornfield in the dark, I was startled. After I was dead, I thought about how there had been the light scent of cologne in the air, but that I had not been paying attention, or I thought it was coming from one of the houses up ahead. Mr. Harvey, I said. You're the older salmon girl, right? Yes. How are your folks? Although the eldest in my family, and good at acing a science quiz, I'd never felt comfortable with adults. Fine, I said. I was cold, but the natural authority of his age and the added fact that he was a neighbor and had talked to my father about fertilizer rooted me to the spot. I've built something back here, he said. Would you like to see? I'm sort of cold, Mr. Harvey, I said, and my mom likes me home before dark. It's after dark, Susie, he said. I wish now that I had known this was weird. I'd never told him my name. I guess I thought my father had told him one of the embarrassing anecdotes he saw merely as loving testaments to his children. My father was the kind of dad who kept a nude photo of you when you were three in the downstairs bathroom, the one that guests would use. He did this to my little sister, Lindsay, thank God. At least I was spared that indignity. But he liked to tell a story about how, once Lindsay was born, I was so jealous that one day while he was on the phone in the other room, I moved down the couch, he could see me from where he stood, and tried to pee on top of Lindsay and her carrier. This story humiliated me every time he told it to the pastor of our church to our neighbor, Mrs. Steed, who was a therapist and whose take on it he wanted to hear, and to everyone who ever said, Susie has a lot of spunk. Spunk, my father would say? Let me tell you about spunk. And he would launch immediately into his Susie peed on Lindsay story. But as it turned out, my father had not mentioned us to Mr. Harvey or told him the Susie peed on Lindsay story. Mr. Harvey would later say these words to my mother when he ran into her on the street. I heard about the horrible, horrible tragedy. What was your daughter's name again? Susie, my mother said, bracing up under the weight of it, a weight that she naively hoped might lighten someday, not knowing that would only go on to hurt in new and varied ways for the rest of her life. Mr. Harvey told her the usual. I hope they get the bastard. I'm sorry for your loss. I was in heaven by that time, fitting my limbs together and couldn't believe his audacity. The man has no shame, I said to Franny, my intake counselor. Exactly, she said, and made her point as simply that. There wasn't a lot of bullshit in my heaven. All right. Yeah. Powerful ending there. <laughs> <laughs> gotta gotta love a good murder in heaven without bullshit story. There you go. All right. So what book did you choose? So I chose Bridge to Terabithia by Katherine Patterson. 
It's a book that I remember reading as a kid. I've reread it now as an adult. I was going to read a passage toward the end of the book, which, spoiler alert, Leslie dies. This book was written in 1977. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, if you don't know what it's about, that's your own fault. But I got a little teary as I was reading through those passages last night. And so I decided instead to stick toward the beginning before death is a part of it. But this book was number eight on the top 100 challenged and or banned books of the 90s. It was number 28 in the first decade of the 2000s. So it's been around the block a few times. As I mentioned, it was published in 1977. So a lot of not of people not liking it. It's mostly cited for its use of profanity because the main character says the word Lord in vain. It doesn't use it in prayer. And also there was some discussion of the fact that it might be promoting secular humanism because Leslie is described as maybe a little, a bit like an atheist. She does, she and her family don't attend church. She doesn't really think she needs religion in her life. But then I found this article by Mary Ness, When the Portal to a Fantasy World Never Opens, Bridge to Terabithia, where she says, I think what people are really objecting to is a book that admits that sometimes kids die and it doesn't make any sense and people do not necessarily deal well with it. In theory, children's books are meant to be good places, safe places, places where only good things happen and where children don't die for no reason at all. We want to protect children, even in books and in what they read. So I'm going to read to you, like I said, from the beginning of the book, when uh, Jess, the main character, first starts interacting with Leslie at a race. At the bang, Jess shot forward. It felt good, even the rough ground against the bottom of his worn sneakers. He was pumping good. He could almost smell Gary Fulcher's surprise at his improvement. The crowd was noisier than they'd been during the other heats. Maybe they were all noticing. He wanted to look back and see where the others were, but he resisted the temptation. It would seem conceited to look back. He concentrated on the line ahead. It was nearing with every step. Oh, Miss Bessie, if you could see me now. He felt it before he saw it. Someone was moving up. He automatically pumped harder. Then the shape was there in his sideways vision. Then suddenly pulling ahead, he forced himself now. His breath was choking him and the sweat was in his eyes, but he saw the figure anyhow. The faded cutoffs crossed the line a full three feet ahead of him. Leslie turned to face him with a wide smile on her tanned face. He stumbled and without a word began half walking, half trotting over to the starting line. This was the day he was going to be champion, the best runner of the fourth and fifth grades, and he hadn't even won his heat. There was no cheering at either end of the field. The rest of the boys seemed as stunned as he. The teasing would come later, he felt sure, but at least for the moment, none of them were talking. Okay, Fulcher took over. He tried to appear very much in charge. Okay, you guys, you can line up for the finals. He walked over to Leslie. Okay, you had your fun. You can run on up to the hopscotch now. But I won the heat, she said. Gary lowered his head like a bull. Girls aren't supposed to play on the lower field. Better get up there before one of the teachers sees you. I want to run, she said quietly. You already did. What's the matter, Fulcher? All Jess's anger was bubbling out. He couldn't seem to stop the flow. What's the matter? Scared to race her? Fulcher's fist went up, but Jess walked away from it. Fulcher would have to let her run now, he knew. And Fulcher did, angrily and grudgingly. She beat him. She came in first and turned her large, shining eyes on a bunch of dumb, sweating, mad faces. The bell rang. Wow. <laughs> a little taste of Bridge to Terabithia. I actually hadn't read that one, so... And I didn't do as much research into the background of why my book was banned as you did. That's all right. <laughs> but yeah, so we hope you celebrate Banned Books with us, Banned Books Week with us from September 18th through the 24th. Pick out your own banned books to read. Thank you for listening to this special episode of Greenwood Gab. Have a great. Have a great.